Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the final meeting of this week as we go through these documents. Now, as we continue to proceed through this, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction for our minds to be open so that we might more properly affix that which we have studied before and that which we are seeing on this printed page to be able to understand and defend the positions that we have found as we have studied. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, there is much we have yet to learn. We have sinned, Father, and there are times that sin colors our understanding and our belief. Help us so that we may not accept that which sin would want us to understand but accept that which you clearly present in your word. I pray, Father, for each one that are in this meeting today. I thank you for their participation, for their input, for their comments. Help us each now that we may join together, be unified, so that we may understand more clearly the message that we are to give at this time in the end. Help us now in all things and in all ways. May your will be done. May your name and your character be glorified. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We thank you for the ability we have to join together. Direct us now. May your spirit open our minds. We ask for your protection by your angels. Thank you, Father. Direct us now for this. We praise you. And from this, we submit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now, we are quickly going to go back over the points that we we were finished with last night, or yesterday afternoon, morning, whatever. It's a lot (laughs) for me, sorry. (laughs) The phrase, in his estate, occurs four times in chapter 11, and each time it occurs, authority is transferred from one entity to the other. To another, Daniel 11, 7, but out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate. Daniel eleven twenty, then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes. Daniel eleven twenty one, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person. Daniel eleven thirty eight, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now I find it interesting. When we covered this directly, that Glenn is trying to say that the first three are male to male, and the last one is female to female. Yet neither the English grammar nor the Hebrew would support this contention. I'm okay. also. Okay. Yep, so just dealing with that. So obviously. You know, he's he's ignoring this idea. But when he's when he's talking about the papacy now as the mother and apostate Protestantism as the daughters, I mean, he's attaching to it these uh, female attributes. I mean, you don't necessarily have to do that. Right. Right. OK, so it's not like the papacy is by definition female and apostate Protestantism by definition female. But he's he's just bringing in from another idea, another place in scripture where you have the mothers and the daughters. So so I don't know if that's really a valid objection here, because here he's taking the papacy as being referred to as a he. Right. And so it's not innate within the, the scripture itself that it needs to be feminine. Right. That it doesn't need to be feminine in order to talk about the papacy, which is the mother and Protestantism. That is the daughter. That, that's the, what I would say about that. But I understand your point. Now, Daniel eleven seven, of course, says, but out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate. So here is a, a very definite reference to female to male. But right. Yeah. And and this one is a trend. Now, out of the branch of her roots, shall one stand up in his estate? So it's the his estate is not 
the woman of the branch of her roots. That would be Berenice, right? Okay. Got it, right? Agreed. Berenice. Um, yeah, I'd pronounce it Berenice. But anyway, yeah, so I wouldn't have put, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that in his estate is is who it's referring to. It's not her roots that right. So it's not a it's not he's not replacing her. He's replacing him, right? That is Ptolemy uh Philadelphus. Okay. Philadelphus, yeah. And then uh he's succeeded by Ptolemy. Your Jetes, uh, your Getes, your Jetes, your your Jetes. Anyway, how do you pronounce that? Right. So, so the her is just again, it's not it's not really relevant in because that's not who he's replacing. Does that right. make sense? Okay. It does. But but the main thing to see is that in the Hebrew, these are not all the same phrase. Right. So in in English they look like they're the same, but they're not. So the only one, like eleven seven, is dealing with uh, somebody replacing someone upon his place or upon his base, referring to the idea that it's someone else's base. He's replacing someone, but that's not the case with eleven twenty and eleven twenty one. So it's a different phrase, and then. 1138 is the same as 117 um, because what's going to happen is the papacy is going to replace Christ or God, right, is the idea. And and it's, so it's not really about a transfer of from one entity to another, right? So he's he's misunderstanding the whole idea of what the word means. and 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 the other thing is, in, in the first three, it does say stand up, but we don't have stand up in verse 38. So that's another point that needs to be, right? Like there's no standing up in verse 38. Correct. And when we looked at stand up, uh, this was, um, and not just connected with his place, but the standing up has to do with a, a role in prophecy. So, I mean, we could go back and I'll look at all the stand-ups, but not all stand-ups are in his place. And it has to do with these successive kingdoms and, and the role that they play, right? So they're, they're taking on these particular roles uh, within the prophecy itself. That's why they stand up. And, and he doesn't really notice, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Doesn't say in his estate shall stand up you know, anything. So it's just not, it's not very, he's not being very precise. He's ignoring the minutia, which, which he calls it, the, the details, which we think are very important. And so it's not following Miller's rules in comparing scriptures. It, it appears to be on the surface. <clears throat> Even in the English, we should be able to see, though, that the fourth one is not the same as the first three. Right. Now, the point that he's attempting to make, I think, is twisting another point that has been well established about, I believe it's, I, I believe this had to do with the little horn, where linguistically it is referred to first as a he and then as an it. Well, yeah. So the he is going to be pagan Rome, the it which is the female form right. is, is going to be papal Rome in that, in that section. I still don't think he's making that issue there. Like I understand what you're saying, but I don't really think that that's an issue here. Okay. Right? Just because in, in, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I know I'm kind of stepping on your toes there, but as I thought about it, because you mentioned it before, and then I looked at it and I said, well, no, this, that's actually not really relevant here because he's not, he's not switching between masculine and feminine or anything. The text doesn't. And he just happens to be using mother and daughters, right? He could have just said a pap papacy and a prostate Protestantism. And, and that would have been, you would, we wouldn't even have thought about the gender issue, right? Because the papacy isn't in, in this context. You know, we don't have the papacy always referred to in the feminine. 
even when it's in, in, in Daniel, right? Because he's going to be a mighty king, right? Or he's going to be the king shall do according to his will. That's all masculine. But yet it's referring to the papacy. So it doesn't mean you have to have feminine for any time it's referring to the papacy. But the other problem was how we looked at the verse itself. So when we looked at this verse, verse 38, we did a study on the God of strength. Right. Ma'az, right. And that is a ref reference to the true God, to almighty God. Right. It's not a reference to some kind of spiritualistic or pagan God. Right. Which it appears to you read the God of forces. It just looks, oh, like the God of forces. That's like some kind of, you know, pagan God of some sort. Right. Okay. But but and also the sentence doesn't actually say that. It doesn't say, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, right? Like it doesn't, it's not the construction of the sentence. So it's, the King James didn't really do a good job translating it. Um, let me see here. Yeah, and, and there's other translations. They they try to make sense out of it as well. So it, it's not like it's um, it's an easy... Uh, it's an easy verse to translate, right? And and you focus upon mu munitions. Correct. But, and the idea is that this is God is our, is our defense, right? That's, that's the idea. The idea is defense. Yes. Yeah. So the other thing is we have this, even here in the King James where it says, but in his estate. Now, now I understand that the Vav can be translated as, but right. Um, that's the, at the consecutive vav is is what begins that sentence. Yet that's not very common. There has to be a really good reason to translate it as but, just because you know Hebrew doesn't really have the word but, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you you have to look at all the syntactical relationships between uh, the sentences to and and the def you know the meanings of what it is that you're talking about if you're going to put it into English as but. So really, it shouldn't be, but it's just a consecutive vav. We usually just, in Hebrew, just translate it as and, right? So he's, in a sense, in Hebrew, they kind of do these run-on sentences. They just, they keep adding this vav to continue that this is part of the same ideas. Does that make sense? Kind of like when you're a kid and you just say and all the time, you know, yeah. before a sentence, <laughs> uh, because you're talking about the same thing. Um, so that's how it is in Hebrew. And then, of course, it, it says, and the God of strength, right? So that's how the sentence starts out. And let me see here, just, uh, um, just looking at the Hebrew here. So when we go through this, and the God of strength upon his base shall they honor, right? Or in his place shall they honor. So the way that I understand that is that this is the true God, the almighty God. They're going to honor him on his base, right? That is, they, they pro pro profess to believe in the true God. But instead, they're going to honor, right? They're going to honor the, um, a strange God in the place of the true God. That's the idea that's here. So it's not a succession from one kingdom to another or anything like that, right? So he says the papacy is succeeded by apostate Protestantism. That is definitely not what is described here in verse 38, e even if you take it in the King James, right? You, you understand what I'm saying? I do. Okay. So is in his place shall he honor the God of fortresses, the God whom his fathers did not know with gold, silver, precious stones, and riches. So we don't have anybody standing up in his place in the first place. And it doesn't show anything about a transfer. So it, it's a little bit of sleight of hand by focusing upon only the phrase in his estate without looking at the standing up and then just seeing in his estate highlighted. If somebody's not careful, they're going to think, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But it doesn't. Right. He's not comparing the same thing. Okay, so that's my analysis. Okay. Now, his next thought begins with this paragraph. 
in the first three instances of the phrase, but in his estate, the context is to the subject, paganism. But in the last verse, the context is still to the subject, now papalism. <clears throat> it must always be remembered that the prophecy of Daniel 11 is only a literal expansion of the previous prophecies in Daniel. The lines of prophecy contained in Daniel always deal in some way with the four combined powers of paganism, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome, and then continues with the power of papalism. These powers, paganism and papalism, are also represented as the first five kings of Revelation 17.10. This phrase, but in his estate, shows the transition from the fifth kingdom to the sixth. Daniel, in giving us this transition, does not elaborate, but leaves it to John to fill in the blanks. Quotation here from 17 Manuscript Releases, page 10, paragraph 2. In the revelation of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel, and thus Daniel is standing in his place. <clears throat> now, it's very nice that he uses this quotation, but do we recognize this quotation for what it is? We studied this section. We studied this particular document in mm -hmm. some detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, now he throws this in here, but it's it's not it's not really supporting what he's saying. I mean, obviously, we know first we're going to have the line of the tribe of Judah, who's going right. to unseal the book of Daniel, that little book in his hand. This is uh, Revelation chapter ten, right? And we're going to have the seven thunders on being sealed up. And in our history, we believe that this movement has unsealed the seven thunders. Right. That is the understanding of Millerite history. So it's fine to say, well, you know, the book of Daniel and Revelation are connected. But but here he's got Revelation 1710, which he just tells us about. He hasn't illustrated any of this. He, he hasn't given us really a Bible study yet. You know, all of the stuff that he has done. I wouldn't call it a proper Bible study. Agreed. Yeah. And and so when he 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 refers us to Revelation 17:10, I mean he's he's referring us to something that you know most people in the movement would think, but not everybody would think that. And we've taken the position that the five kings are not uh these successive kingdoms in in the beast of Revelation 17. Uh, you know, we have the seven heads and the seven mountains being Rome itself. The seven kings are not the seven mountains or the seven heads. So we're looking at, so we look at that differently. But he's he's not, he's he's telling us stuff, but he hasn't illustrated it. And definitely we don't, we don't see what he's seeing. Like, I mean, I understand what he says he's seeing, but I don't see that it, that he should see that he, he's just forced an interpretation upon Daniel 11 that, you know, and part of it, he's using some things like Uriah Smith, like the idea that it's all a literal prophecy, right? Which it, it's, it's more direct, but you can't say that everything has to be literal because we're dealing with things that are spiritual after the cross. And so in the context of Daniel 11, we say, Obviously, the king of the north is not literally the king of the north, and the king of the south is not literally the king of the south, because Greece no longer exists. And so we would need to understand that as a symbol, right, which is the whole thing that he, he misses. If we understand that the battles between the king of the north and the king of the south, especially Raphia and Panean, those two, two battles, become typical of 1798 and 1989. You know, then then Daniel 11 makes sense. And and so when people, you know, don't want to look at the details, they just dismiss them as minutia. They take away the meaning of the text itself. Right. So we, we recognize all of these details are important and, and he just ignores them. You know, it, it's 
it, it's just all over the place. Like, Agreed. It is, it is a very scattered presentation. No. You know, and I've said before that when, when people do this type of, of thing, if you don't understand your topic, it's easy to become scattered. Right. Right. You know, like I teach music theory. Now, when I teach music theory, I can teach it at all different kinds of levels, right? Because I, I'm, I'm dealing with whatever audience I have. If I'm, you know, have an introductory class on music theory, you know, it's the first class, you know, I, I'm not going to bog them down with tons and tons of details that they're not going to understand. Right. It doesn't mean that I've ignored the minutia, right? All of that minutia is necessary for me to understand to in order to present these ideas, right? If I didn't know the minutia, I would end up doing something that's very scattered because I wouldn't know the connections. I wouldn't know how to present it at different levels. I might be able to just, you know, recite something from a textbook that's done it for me. But if I have to now think it through, if I have to answer a question, then I'm not going to know how to do that. And and the other thing, you know, so I've been thinking a bit about, you know, how he has presented things. So the way that I would present something, um, you know, if I'm writing a paper on something like this, I want to, and I've talked about this before, that, that there's, you know, the person's train of thought. You need to sort of follow that. But the thing that particularly creates a train of thought is, is that questions need to be opened that then are answered. Does that make sense to people? Correct. Right, because in, in one ways, you're, you're asking questions, right? That's why, you know, you teach Sabbath school, you ask a question, right? You, you want people to to think. And as they think, they might start developing some answers. And then you deal with those answers that come to people's minds, right? So sometimes they, you know, you ask a question, and there are certain answers that you know that you might get on a particular topic. And, and some of those answers, you know, um, that people haven't thought about them. They're just going to give these rote answers to things. And so you want to direct them to think about it. So you ask them a question about their answer. And and then they start thinking about it. Well, oh, maybe my answer doesn't really make sense. Right. So you help them think through. And, and when you. When you present something, you're wanting that person to, to think it through. You, you can't just force upon them your understanding because if they think it through and they conclude it, then it's something now that they own, right? Right. Now, it's hard to do, especially when you have a group of people, but there's not enough questions in his writing. He's... And he's telling us things where our mind would not naturally go, right? If he's going to try to convince someone of his view, even if he was correct, he's doing a terrible job, you know. And and it's not it's not to criticize him because one is it's it's we're trying to understand what is the problem with this. So I mean, we know there there are problems, but particularly what is it, and what can we learn from it? In our, in our own communication with others. And, and, you know, definitely we have lots to learn on how to communicate ideas to other people. Sometimes we're good at it, sometimes we're not, especially when there's resistance or we're maybe insecure about what we think. You know, we can sort of resort to this because he's just kind of pulling these other things as, as a way to convince us, like things that we might think. You, you understand what I'm saying there? Well, like there's no reason to mention the first five kings of Revelation, but he knows if people agree with him on that point, that that might help them accept his idea, right? He's done this a lot through, I think that's where he gets this scatteredness. It's like, I don't really have a good argument here, but it's like this other thing that I don't have time to look at that you might agree with. Does that make sense to people? Because I, I don't know how everyone feels about this study that we're doing here. like. The, the productivity of it. Um, are we learning things from it? Is is this helping others to understand how we can assess divergent views when mm -hmm. we 
encounter them. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely part of it. And then also understanding ourselves, how we communicate. Right. Because we have, again, this struggle that we have to share this message with people. I mean, we want we want to get better at sharing, right? Right. We want to be effective. And, and yet, you know, there's, you know, one is people are distracted by so many things nowadays. There's so many other videos out there, uh, so many other voices. And, you know, there's people like Glenn here is writing papers, right? So people are, are hearing all this information and it just becomes like in William Miller's dream, you have all of this rubbish, right? Counterfeit coins and jewels and garbage and everything piled upon truth and people have to sort through it. They have to find these gems. And of course we need you know, the line of the tribe of Judah to come in and, uh, you know, sweep away all the rubbish, the dirt brush man. So we need that for ourselves, but also, you know, God has given us these tools to help others. So I'm hoping that we've learned from this, you know, and people can comment on the video, you know, people who are watching the video, whether they think that this has been productive, but it is, for me, it's really frustrating. I mean, I, I would say borders on a depressing, just because you see this barrier that we have to to deal with when it comes to the thinking of others, the, the difficulty of language and the difficulty of these ideas. Yeah, there's just so much that's that's in the way. Like if I could talk to Glenn, I could sit down with him personally and you know, go through things and sort through what he's thinking and and show him why he's wrong, <laughs> you know. Um, but you know, I could help him think it through, right? Like as a guitar teacher, as a teacher, you know, what we're supposed to be doing is help people, helping people think because they need to think, right? And and he just seems unguided in his thinking. It's it's like he has a mind that just wanders on what he thinks is important or whatever idea that comes into his head. But he has never really figured out how to examine it. Another illustration would be, you know, when I teach guitar, what I'm teaching people to do is how to teach themselves guitar, right? So I'm teaching them how to analyze their technique. You know, how to practice, right? How to address all of the little minutiae while at the same time dealing with the bigger picture of expression, right? So how little details affect how a piece of music sounds, right? And and, and they need to learn how to listen to what they're playing. They need to learn how to examine their technique. They need to learn how to play a piece of music that they've never heard before. Now, how do they interpret all of the, the symbols that are there? Um, do they understand, you know, like even the title of the piece, what that means? Like if it's based on like a, a jig or a gavotte or something, what does that mean? A minuet? You know, they need to know what that means, right? It's as if he has never been a Seventh-day Adventist, but yet he he's 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 trying to understand Seventh-day Adventism in this context. If you understand, like, he doesn't seem to understand the underlying principles, that word he uses a lot, principle, of how to study the Bible and actually what the Bible is revealing. So, yeah, I, I'm frustrated, as you can tell. The, the situation here, I agree, and I mirror some of this I agree fully with the frustration because with with what I am reading that he has presented, it hurts because he has chosen to accept what Smith had had presented as if it was a utterance of a prophet. Except he contradicts Smith completely. I mean, he, he's picked on some things of Smith that he, he would agree with. Picking and choosing. Yeah. It's like he's picking what he thinks are the necessary things so that people who believe in Smith, that they can say, okay, well, Smith was right, but he was wrong or something. Right. Now, and a comment there, dealing with Proverbs 5 or 6. Okay. 
Yeah, well, Angela's talking about, and Angela can be a little bit scattered too. I, I think she knows that. So in Proverbs 5, verse 6, uh, I'll have to look it up here quick because I don't have that one memorized. She does not consider the path of life. She does not know that her ways are unstable. And this is, of course, talking about warning against idolatry, right? My son, pay attention to my wisdom and find your ear to my insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. Though the lips of the forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil, in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to, to the grave. I'm reading a different translation here. She does not consider the path of life. She does not know that her ways are unstable. This is, a, I should actually read the King James. I was just looking at another translation here. Less, so this one's actually, uh, the King James is less clear. My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear unto my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb and her mouth as smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and she her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, but thou canst not know them. So I actually like this other translation better for that verse 6. Was that um, young literal? No, it was uh, a Berean study Bible. She does not consider the path of life. She does not know that her ways are unstable. I like that uh, translation there. Uh, with Young's, he has uh, the path of life, lest thou ponder. Moved have her paths, thou knowest not. So I see why the different ways to translate it, because it's kind of a bit obscure in the Hebrew. But but the point is that this woman is is a church, right? False right. doctrine. Right. All of those things that and, and when I think about, you know, um, where it says, you know, uh, her lips drop as the honeycomb and her uh, mouth is smoother than oil. You know, we can see honeycomb. What does that represent symbolically in Scripture? Isn't that like the Holy Spirit? God's word. It's, it's God's word. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then and the oil is the Holy Spirit. Got it. And, and so I, I, can, I think the thing that really bothers me is that he's written this stuff out. That is, you know, like I write papers. When I write a paper, it's it's organized, it's logical. Um, you know, definitely my goal in writing the paper is really clear, and I'm, I'm helping that person to, to understand a topic, whatever it is. I'm, I'm trying to communicate to someone. And... Um, but you can have something that has the form of doing that, but not being doing that, right? So it's not doing that. And that's what his papers are like. It's like, you know, somebody just superficially looking at a paper because, oh, here's a paper and here's another paper. They're sort of equal. You know, they look organized. You know, you, you just you don't read the content, but you just look at the structure and you can say, oh, you know, he's got like subheadings and, and point forms and things are bolded out and but yet there's nothing there. And so it's, it's, it's like this woman right, who, who has an appearance of having something, but it's really unstable. Right. Now, it scares me. You know, there's a number of different levels in which one is I don't know Glenn personally. So I know for you it's more difficult. But, you know, I worry for people. Right. When I see that 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 somehow people are satisfied with this sort of shallow way of looking at information that they have never, they've never. And, and, and I think the key, you know, getting back to what we had talked about in some of the other studies, the key really is that when I study, the whole purpose of study is for God to reveal to me my spiritual condition and his ability to save me. Right. That's why we're studying. Right. And when I see people like, you know, talk about like the give lift service to the three angels messages, but I don't see anything in what they have presented that's redemptive. Right. That that should be bringing conviction. Then, then I I wonder why he has written this. I mean, that's that's the first thing, I guess. 
what is his purpose? What is he trying to show? You know, may, and maybe sometimes, you know, I'm not always good at doing that either. But I always think it when I'm writing something. I'm always thinking about, even if you look at some of my drier papers, like the paper I did on the, uh, Leviticus 23, dealing with the wave sheaf offering. I mean, the whole undercurrent of that paper is really about us learning how to listen to others and um, to recognize that sometimes we take positions in opposition to others that God, if we had studied together, God would have helped us to see the truth. So even though it's a paper on Leviticus 23, which is a rather dry topic, you know, dealing with the timing of the wave sheaf offering and the Passover and so forth, the purpose of the paper is spiritual, right? And, and you can't mistake that from reading the paper. But I don't see anything spiritual in the sense of redeeming, you know, part of the gospel. I don't see the gospel here. It's like <laughs> there's something wrong. Agreed. You know, so, yeah, I just, I know I'm frustrated. And the more I talk about it, the more frustrated I get. But, you know, I'm trying to figure it out. Okay, anyway, we need to go on. In this, he definitely wants people to agree with him. The sad part for me, in the quote that, that he uses from Manuscript Release, this is coming from Mrs. White's papers regarding the views of Brother John Bell. Mm -hmm. And we found those to be enlightening because John Bell was definitely not on the straight path. Yeah. And I'm just I, I'm concerned for him that this these references and these use of Smith's opinions and now this from the warning about Brother John Bell is just, I mean, there's a lot that's being said to me that that he's not clearly studying in a proper manner. Now, his next paragraph. In each of these four texts, a superior is handing to an inferior. The first three are man to man, but 1138 is woman to woman, showing again that there has been a transition from the secular kingdoms to the religious kingdoms. Right, which he wouldn't find from that because it's talking in the masculine form. There would be no reason that he would uh, say that. Correct. Yeah. The original transfer from the secular to the religious occurred in verse 31 showing the transition from the civil to the religious powers, paganism handing off to papalism. It was then that the form of warfare moved from the physical to the mental, and now this power, the mother, is handing off to her daughters, still in the same form of warfare, the mental, spiritual. Now, Daniel 11.31, that he gives reference. Mm -hmm. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, we've accepted this for quite a while in the reference of this with the daily to the abomination which maketh desolate as being that of the first seven times from 723 B.C. down to 1798. Here, he's wanting to place that much later. Well, uh, no, I don't think so. He's putting that there in 538. No, I mean, what I'm saying, I mean, how many Protestants were there in 538? No, but he's saying that it's going to be handed off later. So he's saying in verse 31, we have the transfer from paganism to papalism. And then in 1798, we have the transfer from papalism to the daughters. All right. Um, but the problem here is so he's going to talk about, I mean, because there's no feminine, ver, you know, nothing's feminine in verse 31. Correct. Right. So 
in trying to say it's a transfer from a civil to a religious power, I actually don't think that that's what it is. Well, there's there's no feminine in verse 31. There's no feminine in verse 38. Right. But also, I just don't think that it's it's about a transfer from a civil to a religious power. There's no... It, paganism is religious. Right. Right. So it's not a civil power. Paganism is not a civil power. Paganism is a religion. Rome, both pagan and papal Rome, have civil aspects, right? And, and religious aspects. You know, pagan Rome is pagan, that's religion. Rome, that's civil. Papal Rome is religious, that's papal, and civil, that's Rome. Now, There's just nothing in what he's saying here. Well. Like he's going to go on dealing with the masculine and go and read the next paragraph. Okay. Just a second. In okay. what we're dealing with here, are we not told that linen and other fabrics are not to be combined? Yeah, you don't combine linen with wool. Okay. Right. Because you got one that's plants and the other one's from an animal. Right? But yet, so, through, throughout all of this presentation, we not only have linen combined with wool, we have it combined with polyester, we have it combined with nylon, we have it combined with all sorts of things. This well, is, that's because he hasn't paid any attention to the minutia. Right. The, this, I mean, I can accept at times a patchwork quilt. Mm -hmm. But this is substantially different even from that. Now, when he, he goes into this next paragraph, to understand this, all four texts are addressing the king or ruling entity, which is given in the masculine sense. This is addressing the ability to rule and why apostate Protestantism is linked with the sixth kingdom of the USA. His first sentence here is now opposing the premise that he just made in his examples. Mm -hmm. How can you do that? How can you shift to make a presentation, to give us a premise, and then not even two paragraphs later say, this is the way it is, and oppose your own premise? As he continues, it is the same in principle as that of atheism linked with France. In each case, it is an ideology taking control of a state. Now, yeah, he needs if, to stop using the word principle. He can use idea, right? But he 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 overuses the word principle. Doesn't appear to know what it means. It's almost as if no other word exists. He continues: the papacy can be portrayed as either a man or a woman, as it is both civil and religious. In the book of Daniel, the papacy is never literally spoken of in the feminine sense, only in the masculine, due to its position and title as that of the fifth kingdom in the civil realm. I don't know that I agree with him on that point. No. I mean, I don't know what he means by literally. Well. I mean, I don't actually think that any of it is literal. I mean, when we, when we look at... at Daniel's prophecies, and you say it's literal. It, it's not really literal. Right. There's still symbols being employed. It's it's more direct, but, and, and in that sense, it's more literal, but it's not really literal in, in all the definitions of the word literal. Right. Right. So still symbols are being employed, and um, Definitely the papacy in Daniel chapter 8 is being shown in the feminine sense as part of the little horn. Now, to say literally spoken of in the feminine sense, I'm not really sure what he means by that. Because I would say it's papacy is literally spoken of in the feminine sense. If, if I was to take the meanings of those words and apply them to Daniel chapter 8. Is the papacy described literally? No, it's described symbolically, but it's still spoken of literally or literally spoken of in the feminine sense, right? 
So uh, I'm not sure what, if he understands what words mean. Like, anyway, it's just frustrating. Okay. In the first three examples of the use of in his estate, the one receiving the authority stands up, but not in the case of verse 38, showing that the superior entity is still in control. Now, that doesn't make any sense. And the first thing is he tries to say one is superior and the other is inferior. Right. I don't get see where he gets that from at all. How is the one king who follows another king inferior to the one that was before him? Here again, just as Smith wanted to argue mm -hmm. the king, a king, he's trying to make this same thing to fit his premise. Right. And, and he's not looking at all of the stands up, right? He's only right. looking at uh, the stands up with, in his estate. And then to say, well, the reason why it's not here is for this reason. There's no way that you could just conclude that, right? It, it's a type of circular reasoning, right? It, he's, he's just, he has his view and he has to address the fact that stands up is not there. But that wouldn't be... <laughs> That wouldn't be a good reason to say stand-ups is not there, right? Because it's not just in his estate that's showing a transition. It's the standing up that's showing the transition, right? Right. It's just where is he standing up? He's standing up in the place of someone else. But right. It's not the case in verse 38. And, and to say that it's because the superior entity is still in control is, is it's ridiculous. Like it's it's... Well, it, it'd be like saying, OK, uh, let's say Trump is elected, but Kamala Harris remains as vice president. So therefore, they are both ruling. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's just not it's just not consistent and it's not logical. I mean, it, no. it's I mean, especially when we actually look at how the sentence, the verse 38 should be translated. That really what what we see is we just see the papacy in the place of the Almighty God. Right. That's that's what we see. But he hasn't done a proper study, right? Like I, I think that's the thing that bothers me the most is this this uh reference to Miller's rules and then the complete abdication of any use of those rules. And, and and if he is trying to use them, he's using them in the most shallow sense, which actually doesn't support his case. That if you actually follow through and do the word studies, you're not going to come to the conclusions that he does. Now, he continued, in other words, even though the papacy is handing off to apostate Protestantism, it is still the one who is in main who is the main administrator of the overall strategic plan. The plan of the papacy is to bring the world back to a system of monarchy as opposed to democracy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh. I, yeah, you know, I don't know what, what, he's, what he's getting at and how he could even write that sentence, that last sentence. That last sentence flies directly in the face of many things that are written in the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. And of course, democracy is not necessarily a good thing. Of course, you know, we, we know that the United States is a republic, not a democracy. Right. Um, but it's just, you know, most people don't realize that because they don't know what the difference is. Most people don't know what a republic is. So he concludes this section with the following statement. This concept can be difficult to grasp. Even though the papacy hands off to her daughters, she is still the one in control. Because of this, the papacy remains as the principal subjects of from verse 31 through 45. It should be noted that paganism gave to papalism its power, seat, and great authority, but not so with the prostate Protestantism. Protestantism only exercises or uses the power of the papacy. Here he wishes reference to Revelation 13.2 and 13.12. Yeah, Where, and of course, we would not say it uses the power. Um, it's maybe going to use great authority. 
Because what is the power that she hands over? We know the seat is the city of Rome. Right. It had the power to hand, the power that it handed over was its power, its seat. The great authority wasn't its great authority to hand over. Right. Right. Okay. So so what's the power that, that pa- paganism handed over to papalism? When did that occur? I know Stephen knows the answer. So Clovis? Right. So it's Clovis. So this has to do with the civil power the, or the military power, maybe we would say, right? So we're going to have December 25th, 508 is the date we're going to give. Now, the seat of Rome, that's going to happen earlier. And, of course, we have the donation of Constantine, which is, uh, you know, a fake document. But but the idea is still there. So did the papacy, that, that power, that civil apo- – now, we could say, I guess, you know, apostate Protestantism is the power – of the papacy, that is, it is going to be the civil power. So maybe that's what he means, right? But that's really not given from the papacy to the United States. Right. So uh, the United States is going to give its power to the papacy in the end time. So so paganism gave its power, in a sense, to the papacy because the civil power of Rome was then given to the papacy. To, to put it on the throne of the earth, right? You know, France is going to be the power that does that. It's going to be the one that takes it off, that gives the deadly wound. But that power is, is never given to the United States. The United States instead is going to give its power to the papacy, right? So if we understand those things, it, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't really connect with me. But also, does the papacy hand off to the daughters in any place in scripture. No. No, this th- we don't see this at all. We don't yes. see it in scripture. We can confirm that from the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. But this this entire concept is so very foreign. Mm-hmm. Because it's it's taking and twisting scripture. It's not a true study. Yeah. Because what we have more with Rome is that Rome is going to fracture. Right. Right. So, you know, first, of course, the fracturing is going to happen with the fall of, of pagan Rome, and you're going to have the divisions of the kingdom. But you also have these this threefold division of Babylon. Right. And Babylon is Rome. Right. We understand that. Correct. As a, right. Because Rome is a continuation of Babylon. But but Rome itself divides into these different characteristics, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And yet they will become united under the Sunday law. So there is no succession from the papacy to, to the United States. There's just this fracturing of, and, and you can see that fracturing first with the Protestant Reformation and then with the, the French Revolution, right? So now, that kingdom that had once the papacy had once had the world is now fractured into these different elements, but they will come together, right? That threefold union, but there isn't a handing down or passing over or a transition of power from the papacy to the United States. I think an attorney would make the point. I think, I think Miss White has this quote says <clears throat> the United States, the Protestant churches will reach across the goal to shake hands with the papacy. Yeah. Is that what yeah. it says? Not mm-hmm. to shake hands, but to grasp hands. Grasp hands. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, there, well, there's two different <laughs> quotes. So there's the 5T quote and the Great Controversy quote. And they switch around a bit. And, and uh, I guess they switch around uh, which, which ones the United States uh, grasps hands with first. But and we looked at that before, why the context of what's being talked about, why it's done in that order. Because they're not really, it's not one where she's quoting herself. They're actually completely different topics, but she uses the same phrases. Um, but yeah, so these are separate powers that were once all part of one power. Babylon is divided into three parts, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And the United States is the one that brings these together. 
it creates the image to the beast. So, you know, do the globe are the globalists the one who unite the world and give the Sunday law? I don't believe so. No, they're not, right? It's the United States. It's not the papacy. It's not the globalists. It's the United States that causes this to happen. Okay. Now, we can argue, well, the papacy is behind it all to some degree, but this is something that's initiated in the United States. The United States is going to be the foremost in doing this, right? Without the U.S., this wouldn't happen. And, and we're seeing, you know, presently all this stuff happening in the United States, you know, with this election and everything. And we're trying to figure out exactly how is this going to unfold? How is this going to lead to a Sunday law? And, and I think that within Adventism, there's a lot of misconceptions about how that Sunday law comes about. Um, now, in this paper, um, we're going to find, you know, we don't have part number 13 yet, and we still have more in number 12. But, you know, he's going to state that the, the king of the north and the king of the south are just in talking about this. He says he's going to explain in the na next paper, but it's going to be uh, the United States and the Seventh-day Adventist Church are the king of the north and the king of the south. Right. Which, of course, is ridiculous. But... And, and that they're godly powers. How is the United States a godly power? Especially in giving the situation from Scripture and the spirit of prophecy, because if the United States is going to reach its hand over the abyss to, jump, to grasp hands with the papacy and to grasp hands with spiritualism, there is no way it could be a godly yeah. power. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a godly power. No, but the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not involved in that prophecy. Yeah, I would agree. Correct so, You know, especially if you want to put it at the time of the end being 1798. Right. So, but anyway, let's go on. we got about 20 minutes left. I, I, want, I cannot ask a question. Please. Yep. Um, Dwight, so, um, can you explain why the Seventh Day Adventist Church is not a godly power? Okay, I'm just asking a question. I, I know that you are. So, brother, if if we were to use the same um, logic that we have we've been addressing, that Christ always shows the end from the beginning, right? Right. When Christ came to this earth, was he accepted by his people? No. Was the Jewish church at that time? Okay, I see where you're going. All right. <clears throat> I'm going? Uh, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. Is, is I, that logical for you? Yeah, that's, lo that's logical. I just okay. wanted to, um, I was just wanted to think it through in my head. Okay. I would also think it's difficult to call it a power. No, it's it's impossible to call it a power. Yeah, because it has no power. Okay, because yeah, it's not a, it's not a civil authority. Right. All right. Good I mean, deal. Does the Seventh Day Adventist Church have any authority to set speed laws? Does it no. have Does it have any authority to give judgment? It doesn't have any civil authority. No, I don't have no civil authority. Did the, right. did, did the Jewish church in Christ's time have any civil authority? No, it was Rome that had the civil authority. Thank you. Okay. I just want to get it clear in my head. Sure. And that was a great question. It was much appreciated. Now. The interaction of these three entities, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, can be illustrated by the account of Herod, Herodias, and Salome. In the book Desire of Ages, from pages 214 to 225, Mrs. White gives some insights as to the character of Herod, Herodias, and Salome, which in turn gives us insights of how Satan will operate to cause the United States of America to speak as a dragon. Now, if America is going to speak as a dragon, how can that be a godly power? Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is that logic clear? 
Yeah, but we don't know what he's going to say in his article number 13. So maybe he has some way around that. But uh, okay, go on with this. In, the, in this account, the target is John the Baptist. And these three players work in concert to accomplish his death. John is a representative of God's people. And as such, he is a specific target of these three entities. Of these three, two are unsuspecting and one is the orchestrator. I would say two are orchestrators and one is unsuspecting. That would be a more correct comment. The dragon represents the civil power under the control of Satan. In our case, that of the USA, which is portrayed by Herod. The beast represents the papacy portrayed by Herodias. And the false prophet represents apostate Protestantism that is fully matured into spiritualism portrayed by Salome. Herodias is the mother and Salome is the daughter. It is interesting to note that Herodias was acquainted with the weak points in the character of Herod. Review and Herald. 11th of March, 1873, paragraph 3. In other words, the papacy understands the weak points of our U.S. Constitution. Here he's introducing something altogether different from anything he said before, and he just wants us to accept it. Mm -hmm. The character of our nation is expressed in the Constitution and the founding documents. This becomes significant when understood in the context of papal involvement in our government. At the time of this writing, the papacy has, and has had for a long time, the majority of the justices in our Supreme Court. When researched, the percentage of Catholics in both houses of the Senate and the state are greater than their percentages in the general public. Georgetown University, established in the very heart of our nation's capital, is world-renowned for its education in law and the courses it offers on how to influence public policy. Okay, so first thing is, um, before you go on, there is no weak points in the U.S. Constitution. And there's no weak points in the Bill of Rights. Right. The weak points lie within the people of the United States. Yep. Agreed. Because a republic is only as strong Amen. as, as uh, the conviction of its citizens. So it relates to Benjamin Franklin and, and his the question that was uh, asked him as mm-hmm. to what type of government they would have. Uh, he said a republic, if you can keep it. Yep. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Historically accurate quote. Very nicely done. She knew that under ordinary circumstances, while his intelligence controlled him, she could not obtain the death of John. Are we to twist these words? I would think not, but the English is fairly clear. She, referring to Herodias, his, referring to Herod, him, referring to Herod. But why can't we insert Caesar into this? I mean, this would keep with the logic that's being used in the the past in the paper. When the Sunday law is first instituted, our government is still in control, is still controlled by the Constitution, which guarantees our freedom to worship according to the dictates of our conscience. The papacy knows that while the Constitution is fully intact, it cannot of itself secure the death of those who have committed the same offense as that of John pointing out the illicit marriage of church and state. Does it look like this is going to be the point under which a death decree is going to be promoted? The illicit marriage of church and state. I I don't agree with this. Herodias knew that by direct measure, she could never win Herod's consent to the death of John. And she resolved to accomplish her purpose by stratagem. Desire of Ages 221.1. Now, if you note, here in the blue, she knew that under ordinary circumstances at Al, he chooses not to provide a quotation. Here he does. But he wishes for us to look upon the definition of stratagem. Stratagem is a noun. 
from the Greek to lead an army. An artifice, particularly in war, a plan or a scheme for deceiving an enemy. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Now, the question we must ask ourselves, is this a valid point for us to consider at this time? Now, as I'm... Sorry, go ahead. I'm just not sure why he thinks that's significant. Well, here's here's the problem that I have. There are two definitions to stratagem. Right. Yeah. He wants to make use of this one, saying an artifice, particularly in war, a plan or a scheme for deceiving an enemy. Yeah. Where it also means an artifice, a trick by which some advantage is intended to be obtained. Correct. And it's the second definition, the secondary rather than the primary, that would would fit better in the way that Mrs. White has written this. Yes, because it's definitely not a war that's being talked about. Correct. Yet he wants us to consider this as a war. Mm -hmm. You're not sure why. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's like he doesn't follow through with the thought. He He's hinting at something, but he's not telling us what, where, why he's going that direction. Here is where Salome comes into play. Rodius could not directly cause Herod to execute John the Baptist, and now Salome is employed to provide the needed assist. Salome was in the first flush of womanhood and her voluptuous beauty captivated the senses of the lordly revelers. It was not customary for the ladies of the court to appear at these festivities, and a flattering compliment was paid to Herod when this daughter of Israel's priests and princes danced for the amusement of his guests. The king was dazed with one. Desire of Ages 2.21.2 Herodias instructed Salome to dance before Herod, realizing that Herod, dazed with wine, would be more likely to grant her wish for the death of John. In the Bible, wine represents either true or false doctrine, and Herod being dazed rather than enlightened represents the USA coming under the influence of a false religion. I don't see a proof. I don't, I, I don't see anything that's offering for this. It, it just... How can how can he make the application that Herod is the USA? Yeah, well, yeah. So, I mean, we can take the position, you know, Herod represents the Protestants of the United States. Uh, let me see. What? How do we understand this? So Herod represents the Ten, ten Kings, right? Yeah, he represents, um, because um, remember how we understood it. He's confusing me a little bit. So, so we have the Protestants who do the dance, right? Which is, yeah. Herodias. And then. <clears throat> Herodias is. is, is Salome, is, Salome, is, Salome. Herodias is representing the papacy. Right. And Herod um, the ten kings. The king of kings. No. Ten kings is what he said. Ten kings? Yeah, ten I said the ten kings. Oh, ten kings. Okay, is that how we applied it before? Yes, it is. Well, so that that would be the the UN, right? Right. And yeah, the so, uh, sort of parallel with Jezebel, the prophets of Baal, and Ahab. Ahab was the king of ten kings. Okay, so, so you maybe parallel Herod with uh, Ahab. Yeah, so he's going to have Herod being the United States and Salome being who? Well, Salome, he's trying, he, he's going to attempt this. Now, I'll, I'll just go to the next paragraph. Okay. Salome was in her first flush, flush of womanhood, and that they were captivated by her voluptuous beauty. This represents the finished product of apostate Protestantism, fully united with spiritualism. In other words, by uniting with spiritualism, apostate Protestantism has arrived at womanhood no longer a child, but fully able to enchant and seduce. So by implication, he's trying to say that Herodias is the papacy. Herod 
he's trying to say is the USA, not the USA, the UN possibly. And here he's wanting to say that Salome is apostate Protestantism and spiritualism combined. Yeah. See, and, and we would have, you know, spiritualism is the dragon power, right? Right. Yeah. Well, if you can, if you, if you uh, consider that the United States would join in with the UN, if he's thinking about it that way. Well, but the United States joins with uh, the papacy as well. So right. three powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But he has two of these being representative of the false prophet. Right. Right. Because he's just said there's, you know, the dragon, the beast. So to him, the dragon power doesn't exist as an entity. It's just something that influences the United States and Protestants. Right. Like it, it, anyway, our time is almost up here. Right. I know that I've caused a lot of frustration, and for that I apologize. <laughs> you haven't caused it. But no, this is a good good process. Um, you know, I think it's good that we're doing this. Uh, we probably should be finished on Sunday morning, This this unless he has paper 13 come out before then. Um, if anything, it makes you think a little bit. It, it makes you think quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, this is really good after we had done our study on Daniel chapter 11, um, you know, to go through this um, in this way. But yeah, it is it is frustrating and a bit discouraging, um, but it's still enlightening. Um, so I, I still think it is useful, but um, I really would like to talk to Glenn. But I know you're writing the letter. Anybody who wants to talk to him, I'm more than happy to give you a telephone number. I'm more than happy. I mean, his his email has been on several of these documents. So. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I need to see him in person. I need to see the guy's face. Zoom or something. At least. Okay. Well, okay. So we'll okay. come back Sunday. Any other thoughts or comments at this point? Any other questions? Okay, shall we close our session with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together, and we thank you for the things that you are presenting for us to consider. Help us now, direct us through this day. May that which we do be according to your will. Be with us in all things. Show us, Father, where we should walk, how we should walk, and how we should speak. Be with us now, we ask, direct us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.